code. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, couple of things to note. First of all, um, this is a continuation of last week's well attended session um, on the Forum 100. This is continuing into Forum 101. Uh, and it is also going to deal with the BRAs and the listing agreement. Um, and so I would suggest for those of you who are watching this online, uh, as we're going to skip over a lot of the Forum 101 today because we've addressed it last week, do see this as part two of a two-part series um, such that, oh, who knows, we may do other forms as well. Maybe there'll be more than these, this, but for the purposes of Forum 101, uh, Form 101 must be understood in the larger context of what we addressed last week, which dealt with so many of the particularities um, that we're going to be addressing today. Second point I'm going to bring up uh, is that this lecture uh, or session, like all video sessions that we put on, are public. Our forum is private. Our video sessions are public. They're posted in a variety of public sessions and everyone needs to be aware of that. Okay, so let's get started. Um, let me start by screen sharing um, my thing of the day. Uh, and this has absolutely nothing to do with real estate, uh, but is a truism as um, tech savvy or Bell, I guess who works on Bell's backbone is doing some work on my street. And uh, my wife has heard, heard me uh, scream expletives pretty much all morning. Uh, so I figured before you marry a person, you should first make the music computer with slow internet to see who they really are. I don't think a truer statement has ever been issued by anyone. Kudos to you, Will Ferrell, on bringing that up. All right, let's start into things uh, without further ado. I am going to start uh one second please bear with me i am going to start with form 101 there it is and i'm going to share my screen there it is can one of you just do me a favor please and confirm that you can see uh my form 101 on the screen yep okay awesome okay so again, keeping in mind that I'm going to be skipping a lot of this form because we've dealt with it last week, I'm going to go into areas that we did not address uh, last week, but that are pertinent both in Form 101 um, and then, of course, the listing agreement uh, and the buyer representation agreement. I suspect that this thing will not take a full hour, but probably about 45 minutes just for people who need to time uh, their day. Um, all right, again, I'm using, for the, those of you who are new, there are forms that are available through the OREA website called Forms Explained. These forms have little provisions that explain exactly what our normal forms do. And these P parts in red are included by the OREA as explanatory notes. And if ever you want a quick understanding of what uh, something means, uh, downloading the OREA explanatory notes and explanatory documents are actually a really good way of actually figuring it out. Without further ado, allow me to proceed forward. Uh, I need to load up one more thing before I begin. I'm sorry, I forgot to load up one presentation. There it is. Where am I? There we go. Um, okay. So, the first thing I want to mention is a general concept uh, of this agreement. And by the way, this would extend to the Form 100 from last week as well. And that is the concept of non est factum. A non est factum means that it is my signature, but it is not my deed. Um, and this is a critical component in law. If you're able to prove that, yeah, sure, my signature is on the document, but the document wasn't explained to me for reasons that have to do with the context in which something was signed, then oftentimes courts will invalidate those contracts and the concept that we're talking about is not as factum. The case that I always studied was a case called Tilden Rent-A-Car. And what happened in that instance was the gentleman um, was on a, a plane 
um, and he um, had a drink of alcohol, uh, a single drink, and he got off the plane, luggage in tow, and he went uh, to the car rental place, and he rented a car, and he bought insurance. Uh, and then he got into his car and then got into an accident with someone like a surgeon and owed about $2 million. And the insurance denied coverage because his blood alcohol limit was 0 0.02. The legal blood alcohol limit was 0 0.08, of course, so he was well below it. But there was a term found in the uh, five or six page contract, uh, which he had not read, which was not called attention, which, and which they did not call attention to. Uh, which basically said you have to have zero blood alcohol. And the court said, yeah, he signed that document, but no one bothered to explain it to him. What's more, there was no intention, uh, there was no reasonable expectation that he would have been held to that. Um, in fact, one of the reasons that when you rent a car now, you have to initial here, initial here, initial here, initial here, is because that way they are able to show that they called your attention to the various provisions that they intend to rely on if they choose to deny a coverage uh, or insurance coverage to you. Um, and that's the concept of non-as factum. And non-as factum, why am I going into this? Well, it exists for the purposes of real estate as well. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I'm gonna share a different screen, if you don't mind, for a second. Um, and I'm gonna bring up a small claims court uh, decision, which I found very interesting. Small claims court isn't necessarily binding as precedent, but I do think that this would be found um, useful uh, for the purposes of facts uh, going forward. And what this is, is uh, Kajmana. Uh, and, and the basics behind this, if you read the case, strangely, I can't find the case on Canley anymore. I, I used to have the case, I can't seem to find it. But basically what happened here is, um, there is a um, woman uh, who has just given birth um, and uh, her husband. And as you can imagine, they were bringing an offer on a house. And as you can imagine, um, the day of the offer was a mess. Um, she had, after all, just given birth. And so the agent came by with the VRA uh, that locked them in for six months for all property and basically threw it in front of her. And at evidence at court was that, you know, she was disheveled and, and you know, had like, yeah, it was twins, I think, had two babies hanging off her breasts, feeding at the time that this was signed. It was like, it was the most incredible, she was sleep deprived and God knows what, and they're like, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here. And she was under the impression that what she was doing was making an offer on this house. And little did she know that her signature basically bound herself to the buyer, uh, so the buyer's agent, excuse me, uh, for six months for all property. Um, and when they in fact lost the offer, they then went into a new build agreement. And at that point, uh, the agent sued them saying, I have assigned VRA. The court found that similar to the gentleman who rented the car, um, that the deed that was put on the agreement, uh, sorry, that the signature that was put on the agreement did not constitute a deed, did not constitute a commitment because they had no reasonable understanding of what they were signing. And the reason I'm starting with this case is because it's really critical that people understand uh, what these agreements mean whether it be the BRA, whether it be the listing agreement, whether it be the agreement of purchase and sale uh, or anything else. It's harder to claim for the purposes of the purchase agreement of purchase and sale. But I'm just pointing that out as a general concept. It really is a critical one. Okay, let me uh, go back, if you do not mind, to the form uh, 150, because that, or 100, excuse me, 101. Uh, and let's start going through this. So you're gonna make sure that your clients understand this in detail. Um, and they're gonna understand the BRA and they're gonna understand the listing agreement in detail. Because otherwise you may have a non as factum problem. And let's understand it in detail. So firstly, um, buyer is, as we discussed in last week's session, could be a corporation, could be under power of attorney, could be under anything else. And there's ways of actually doing that. Check out last week's session if you're interested in it. And the seller, similarly, we've dealt with it. The property, however, is something else. The property here is the legal description. Um, that is different than the known as. So you see where it says known as here? That is the how, how a condo is properly known. So it may be section, uh, sorry, unit 1501, um, and it may be 
um, uh, whatever the proper municipal address is. But that isn't necessarily congruent with what the true unit level or condominium plan is, which is derived from the status certificate. So the information that you have to place here is the legal information contained in the status certificate, not what is the number on the door. This here is the number on the door and that is how it's identified. As an aside, you may wonder, well, why is it that there's a difference between the legal descriptions uh, and what's on the door? And the answer is because um, the legal descriptions, they try to match them to the, what are called the municipal descriptions, uh, but they are assigned long before construction is finished. And sometimes the particularities of construction are such uh, that they have to move a unit, they have to do something or another, and suddenly one number is off or one number is missing. And accordingly, you find that the legal descriptions of a condo do not always perfectly match uh, the municipal descriptions of a condo. So please be advised that they are different. Um, if you haven't gotten a status certificate, uh, do look for the MLS um, and take what is known on the MLS. And then when a lawyer does a review, part of the status review should be to determine what the legal description of the unit actually is for the purposes of helping you. Um, if there is a parking space, you're gonna put the parking space, the legal description of the parking space, and similarly for the locker. Purchase price we dealt with last time. Uh, deposit we dealt with last time. I am not planning on bringing up any more uh, commentary on both of those things, though there's quite a bit. You can check out the last week's session. Similarly, irrevocable date remains the same. The completion date remains the same. The notices provision remains the same. All of these things were dealt with last week. All of these things are being skipped. The chattels, the fixtures, the rental item, all of them are uh, the same. Then we have uh, the common expenses. And what it said, this is new, because obviously a freehold, a Form 100, doesn't have common expenses. And what this says is that the seller represents to the buyer that the common expenses presently payable to the condominium corporation are approximately X dollars per month, which amount includes the following. Now, this um, warrant is a promise. Uh, it is a promise that as of the date that this agreement of purchase and sale was signed, that the amount payable is X. Oftentimes, you will find that the amount that they are warranting is different than the amount that is actually payable. And usually that amount is off by only a couple of dollars, $10, $20, whatever it may be. For those of you who are new, uh, the reason for that is because condo fees go up every year. And there is often a cycle problem where it takes three months to close a deal. The warranty is coming in month one. The change in condo fees for that year takes place in month two. And in month three, there is a closing. The warranty, of course, extends to the condo fees that were there at the time that the agreement of purchase and sale was signed. You cannot go after them because there has been an increase scheduled by the condo later on. HST, this is the same thing as last week. Uh, remember that under the Excise Tax Act, HST is exempt on the type of property that involves residential housing, that is to say where people keep their underwear, whether rented or not, doesn't matter. And as a result, HST, if you say it's included in and provided that this hasn't been used for commercial purpose, like a massage parlor or, or uh, you know, doing, doing work out of it where you've claimed input tax credits, assuming that it has just been used for the purposes of rent, residential rent, or uh, has been used for the purposes uh, of residential living, uh, then HST is not applicable and therefore writing included has no consequence. Uh, the type of title search date is the same. We went into great detail last week on what the title search date is. Um, I will leave it out now as well. Um, the reason I'm skipping all this is because I have a lot to say about other things, obviously. So let's just keep on moving. And also, if you're interested, just check the last lecture. 
Um, title um, remains the same, except that there is something that says that you are ready to accept all condo element rules and other rules and regulations. Um, and that is really critical. Um, you cannot get out of a deal. I once had someone who said, I didn't know about this rule. It pertained to dogs, actually. Um, they didn't get a status review. And they said, I didn't know about dogs. There was no representation or warranty made by the seller in any respect. Um, can I get out of the contract? And my answer was, no, you cannot. Um, you are bound to the rules of the condo. Um, and those rules specifically say that dogs over 25 pounds, and this dog was over 25 pounds, uh, are not acceptable. Um, so you are in real trouble. Uh, you are bound to those rules even before closing if you determine you do not like them. That seems fairly obvious, but you know people have fights about everything uh, in these, uh, <laughs> with these agreements. Remember what I said last time, Mitch Goldhar's famous expression, a contract is merely a collection of things that have gone wrong in the past. Originally, the OREA forums committee probably didn't have that line, and then eventually there were several people who had this dog problem, and now that is part of this uh, session. I'm sorry, by the way, I'm losing my voice, so I do apologize if, if I sound a bit raspy, raspy today. Uh, closing arrangements remain the same as last week. Let's talk about this, and I want to spend some time here because I'm going to tell you something you probably don't know. Though it was on my forum last week, I'm just going to bring this up, though. Let's read section 13. It's an important provision. The seller represents and warrants to the buyer that there are no special assessments contemplated by the condominium corporation, and there are no legal actions pending by or against or contemplated by the corporation. The seller consents to a request by the buyer or the buyer's authorized representative for a status certificate from the condominium corporation. Buyer acknowledges that the condominium corporation may have entered into a management agreement for the management of the condominium corporation. So let me start with an easy line. The seller consents to request by the buyer or the buyer's authorized representation for a status certificate from the condominium corporation. That is there because some morons down at condo offices somehow believe that they only have an obligation to provide the cost status certificate to unit owners. That's actually not true. Anyone is allowed to pay $100 under section, I think it's 76, I may be wrong about the section, but I think it's 76 of the Condo Act, um, and uh, obtain a status certificate for any property, period. Um, you don't need this, but having said that, it's good to have it here, uh, why not? Um, though I will tell you the condo isn't bound by this by virtue of privity of contract anyways, but still, let's move on. Um, the uh, last line is equally innocuous. Uh, basically, if there's a management company, PS, almost all large corporations have a management company. You can't object to it. So great. You know, Tridel has Tridel management or whatever, uh, whatever it may be. Um, I'm much more interested in the first line, and I actually want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Seller represents and warrants to the buyer that there are no special assessments contemplated by the condominium corporation and there are no legal actions pending by or against or contemplated by the condominium corporation. What does that mean? Well, it means, as it says on its face, that there are no special assessments contemplated and there are no legal actions pending by or contemplated by the condominium corporation. Okay. I get that, meaning that if I don't have a status certificate, if I go in firm on a deal, I still have this representation and warranty. The real question that arises is, remember, they're not saying to the best of their knowledge and belief. They're saying there is no special assessments contemplated by the corporation, and there are no legal actions pending. Where this gets muddy, or at least was muddy until about last year, is does this representation and warranty, by the way, representation and warranty means a statement and a promise. Does this representation and warranty exist until the date of closing? Or is it a representation and warranty that was made as of the time the agreement was signed? I have personally fought many battles with other solicitors where I have asserted the former. That is to say, thank you very much. 
you've represented and warranted that there are no special assessments contemplated by the corporation. So we're still before closing. I am holding you to that representation and warranty. And because I screamed it into the phone loud enough, I was successful in some cases. Having said that, it turns out that what I was screaming into the phone was incorrect and has been determined to be incorrect by case law. With your permission, I'm gonna share a screen to something else, excuse me. This is something I took off the web uh, from Canly directly. And it is a case that I brought, I made reference to actually as part of a write-up that I did for our forum. Um, and it deals with the case of Beatty and Way, which is a court of appeal judgment. And what I want to pay attention to is really what I've highlighted here in red. I'm just going to change the view so that it's a bit bigger, if you don't mind. So what it says is the court of appeal noted exactly when a representation and warranty is to actually be demarcated. That is to say, can you do it until the day of closing or does it pertain to a property as of the date that the agreement was signed? And the court found that it was the latter. The court noted that the parties had conducted extensive negotiations before determining the final wording of the contract. That's not the case here, but it still stands. And what they're saying is that if you want a representation and warranty to extend to the date of closing, you have to specifically write it that way. So you either have to say that the seller's representation and warranty was made both at the time of entering into the agreement and thereafter continuously down to the date of closing, or you have to mention that it was a condition of closing that, um, um, at, and at the time of closing, there had never been these litigations or special assessments contemplated by the corporation. Um, so in the event that a seller is not concealing material information from the buyer, and that, by the way, they reasonably could not know about any special assessments or litigation, um, then their representation and their warranty extends only to the time the agreement of purchase and sale was signed. And I hope that that is clear. And again, the case that makes that relevant is Beatty and Way. I'm going to pause here for a minute. Does anybody have any questions uh, about that and the way that we now interpret representations and warranties contained in the agreements of purchase and sale? Everyone understands it? Okay, good. Uh, happy to see so many of you joining now. Um, okay, the documents in discharge remains, oh, sorry, I forgot to reshare my screen. I apologize. Let me just share my screen. Where is this? There it is. Um, the documents in discharge remains the same. Sorry, I, I just need to get my chat function back up. Okay. Uh, remains the same. Um, the meetings. Um, this is a bit different, uh, although it's pretty obvious on his face. I don't have much to say about it. The seller represents and warrants to the buyer that at the time of the acceptance of this offer, the seller has not received a notice convening a special or general meeting of a condominium corporation regarding respecting the termination, any substantial alteration, or substantial change in assets or liabilities of the corporation. Um, I, what's interesting is that is is whether or not oh by the way and if they do receive that then the question is can you get out of the the agreement what's interesting to me is that liabilities um provision um any substantial change in assets or liabilities it is the case that litigation is a liability in the form of risk at least that's my interpretation that's backed up by any financial statements that the corporation actually provides um, where material risks include substantial litigation. It is therefore, and I have used this in the past, actually just the past month, in the event that we are barred, in the event that litigation arises after, after the, agree the representation and warranty is extended um, via section 13, but before closing, something a lawyer can do 
using Form 101 is state that any new litigation that has arised prior, again, to closing, but after the representations and warranties of Section 13 have expired and after the status certificate has expired, you can claim that that litigation is a substantial liability to the corporation, assuming that it is substantial litigation, and pursuant to the terms, ask to get out. To the best of my knowledge, that hasn't been decided by the courts. I'm just telling you that that's what a good lawyer who understands their form may do for a client in the event that they are presented with a situation where litigation arises in that interim period. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, inspection, fine, it's the same. Approval of the agreement. Um, there is, particularly in downtown Toronto, particularly in large buildings that were built in the 60s and 70s before condos were uh, de rigueur. By the way, that's part of my bingo card. I use the word de rigueur, so uh, I now get to say bingo. Um, I've used a lot of big words this morning, so uh, de rigueur was the last. Um, the notion that a co-op uh, or the notion of a co-op is that um, there is a board and the board generally needs to approve your application. You may ask, what is this approval process to which we care about? Why is there an approval process for something like a co-op? Well, it's perhaps worthwhile me doing the whole session on co-ops, but suffice it to say, a co-op has a much higher, it has a lower price, and that's because there's less demand and that is not because there's more supply, but rather because there's more restrictions on people who can purchase. Generally, people require at a minimum 25% down on their financing. And generally, the approval of the agreement is conditional upon proving that you can afford that 25% down. At least that's been my experience with co-ops to date. I bring that up only because if you're wondering what the approval, when there might be an approval process, obviously that doesn't exist for most strata condos. Uh, it does, however, exist for co-ops um, and co-ownerships particularly. Um, and again, we can do a whole session on that, but just suffice it to say, that's largely the reason that this is here as part of our form. Um, Okay, insurance, same thing. Document prep, the same thing. Residency, same thing. Adjustments, same thing, except that it now ex includes common expenses. Uh, property assessment, same thing. Time limit, same thing. In fact, it's really all the same thing. It's all same, 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 same. Um, the only other thing I would mention is that your Schedule A generally has a conditional upon status review for a solicitor. Uh, allow me to make a plug for the good solicitors, all of whom are really, not all of whom, but many of whom are part of this forum. Uh, by the way, that's not to say that there are bad solicitors as part of our forum. I'm just to say that there's other good solicitors that maybe aren't part of our forum. That's what I was getting at. Um, but it is worthwhile pointing out that Schedule A um, should contain a status review clause. And that status review clause should be done by a, by a lawyer within 24 hours. Um, at our firm, we do status certificate reviews within one hour. Um, most firms uh, that are of quality can get a turnaround in a single day. It isn't hard. They should have their precedence. Um, and if it's a clear status certificate, it's relatively easy to do. Um, I, I bring this up because those people who contact my office and say, my solicitor is three days into my status review. I only have four days. I'm getting nervous. I, you just got to laugh at that. Um, there is no reason other than a solicitor is just not giving your file the time of the day to do a solicit to do a standard review. Uh, experienced solicitors should be able to do a status review really in 10, 10 minutes time. Uh, that's how long it should take unless there is a substantial problem that requires um, further analysis. Uh, and by the way, we've done a substantial Discussion on status certificates and the review clause on this forum. There are videos out there on my website and jmlegal.ca uh, and you can find it out on the Ontario Realtor Forum. Uh, if you'd like to take a look at it, a lot of people found it very useful, particularly those people who function in the condo space. I would encourage you to take a look. So that really is the Forum 101. Again, 
Um, you must understand the Form 101 in context with the previous lecture where we've dealt with so many of the other clauses that I've just kind of run over very quickly here. <clears throat> and with your permission, as it's now 1030, I am going to move on to the BRA and the listing agreement. Um, the BRA and the listing agreement <clears throat> are interesting things. So we've talked about the fact that, first of all, it's really critical that people understand what it is that they are signing. Um, and I cannot tell you how often it is that I am approached by people who are said, who, who basically come to me and they say, yeah, I signed a BRA and I had no idea what it was. Um, I've done a previous session on ways you can, your commission is, may very well be in peril. Um, I would encourage all of you to watch it because the Consumer Protection Act has quite a bit to say on the way that we can solicit these contracts, whether it be a buyer representation agreement or a listing agreement. And in fact, if we act inappropriately, um, there are ways that these contracts can be canceled and become non-enforceable before the courts. Um, very useful video session, again, on my website, again, previously part of our group. I would encourage you to take a look at it. I will be revisiting one or two of the points that I brought up that day uh, right now. Um, and particularly, I want to call attention to a couple of other cases right now uh, that you may not be aware of. So I'm going to share, firstly, uh, I'm just going to quickly share um, the listing agreement. Why not? Um, and I'm going to talk about the fact that a listing agreement is between a brokerage and a particular seller. And the first thing I want to point out to you is that the particular seller matters. I'm gonna bring your attention to a case that is on point. Uh, probably should spell signatories properly, there we go. Um, so this here is Remax, Rouge River, and Gallagher. Let's review this in some detail. The buyers are a couple. Only one of the purchaser spouses signs the buyer agency agreement, and the other, enters into the agreement of purchase and sale. The brokerage sues for commission, claiming that the spouse represented both parties and the way the agreement was structured was specifically to get around that agreement. That is to say only one of the spouses signed uh, the BRA. Um, and because only one of them signed, the other one was able to go with someone else and enter into an agreement of purchase and sale where only their name was on that agreement of purchase and sale. And Remax was justifiably upset. They said to that spouse, you signed on behalf of your collective. And the court said, no, 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 no. Only the husband signed the buyer agency agreement. And it's the wife who submits the offer to purchase the property. And thus the court cannot find that the wife was a party to the original buyer agency agreement. Now, what you may not know, which makes it worse for Remax, but better for these people trying to evade the BRA, is that the people who sign the, I know some of you do new build construction a lot. And in new build construction, for the purposes of HST and for the purposes of the builder's contract, the people who are on the agreement of purchase and sale are the people who have to take title. But that is not the case in law, absent specific clauses in the agreement, which the Form 101 and the 100 do not have. In fact, the agreement of purchase and sale is merely the obligation to provide money on the day of closing by that person who signs it. It has nothing to do with who takes title, which can be determined by the person who signed the agreement of purchase and sale. That's the reason that the agreement of purchase and sale signed by an individual can be in you can that individual can choose to engross their deed in the name of a corporation in the name of their kid in the name of their husband or anyone else and so in this instance even though the wife signed the second agreement she was able to engross the deed on registration in both of their names and at that point the husband was not in violation of their existing bra because he had never entered into a new agreement of purchase and sale with another party at any time. In fact, his name was placed purely by the wife instructing the deed to be engrossed. And thus, it is really critical that where it says seller in the box, 
Um, let me just turn, try to going back to the listing agreement where it says seller here that you list both husband and wife or the collective group of people who are engaging in the project with you and who you want to bind. And this is true both of the listing agreement uh, and it's true of the um, buyer representation agreement. All right, so we are listing it for sale and we have an exclusive right to list for this and that it shall go on if it's more than six months, you're gonna sign it here um, or initial here. It is pretty obvious, I don't really need to comment on that. And to offer the property for sale for a price of X upon the terms specifically set out herein and other price or terms acceptable to the seller. Um, it is understood that the price and terms set out herein are the seller's personal request after full discussions with the listing brokerage's representative regarding potential market value of the property. Now that may seem like a lot of wordage or verbiage. Verbiage, by the way, bingo. That's my second bingo of the, of the session. Um, but I want to address the question that I get from a lot of agents, even seasoned agents. Well, what happens if an offer is brought in at this price and rejected? And that will be something that I address as I turn, as I can combine this particular clause with section two, uh, the commission payment, which I will get to. Okay. Um, so um, the definitions are very straightforward. I am not going to uh, talk about them very much, except to bring up one point, which I think most people never really read properly. If you read this line here, it says, related corporations or affiliated corporations shall include any corporation where one half of the majority of shareholders, directors, or officers of the related or affiliated corporation are the same as the shareholders directors or officers of the corporation. The reason I bring that up is because if you recall the case we've just talked about with Gallagher and Gallagher, uh, we do have a problem um, practically if you are signing a BRA or a listing it, well, particularly a BRA in the name of a corporation, because the concept of Gallagher is the individual who signs the agreement must have signed the BRA. Well, what happens if it's a corporation? Um, I mean, someone can just go ahead and then incorporate a different corporation and then they won't be bound. Well, the listing agreement stipulates, and so does the buying agreement, stipulates that if it's a related corporation as defined here as having the same owners or 50% of the same owners, then they are still bound. And it's worthwhile just kind of point, pointing that out. It's, it's a good provision. I've never had a chance to use it in my career yet, but I look forward to the day that I can. Um, okay, let's move on. Oh, sorry, I think I have a chat. Um, Ish asks, that's valid only if both are on title, right? Um, Ish, I'm sorry, I think this was a, a question that you probably asked during my last session and I missed it. Um, can, you, can you clarify? I'm sorry, what, you just come on by voice and just ask the no, question. Mark, uh, this was the question where you said the sellers, uh, you gotta mention both husband and wife uh, on, that, uh, on that listing agreement. Is that valid only if they both are on the deed, like on the title, or? Well, the, general, the, 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 idea behind what, the idea behind what I was saying, Ish, is that um, you don't want to allow them to pull the rug out from under you. And as a result, what matters is not who is on the deed, but whether or not either of the two parties can sign an agreement of purchase and sale with someone else. And as a result, you really want to get both names on the BRA such that if either of them engage in an agreement of purchase and sale using a different name, uh, then you uh, have them effectively, if you will. Does that make so sense? What you mean is that uh, hypothetically, if there's a couple and uh, the, the property is only on a husband's name, the wife can actually go with another agent and sign an agree listing agreement for that same property? That is correct. Because it's a matrimonial house, that's why I guess. It has nothing to do with a matrimonial home at all. It has to do okay. with the fact that the only people who are bound by, sorry, did you say for a listing agreement or for a buying agreement? Uh, listing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my, my, my apologies. Um, you're asking a different question. I, uh, and, and with respect, 
I'm going to answer it by kind of railroading over your question and just reasserting what it is that I was trying to get at. I don't want to answer your question because it, it deals with very, very different items. And I'll, I'll, I'll take that offline and I'll address it with you. What my point was is this. If you are acting for a buyer, let's not use a listing agreement. If you are acting yeah. for a buyer and a buyer representation agreement is signed by one party, one spouse, then that does not bind the other spouse if they choose a loan to enter into an agreement of purchase and sale to purchase the property. Got That's it. what I was getting at, pure and okay. simple. I, I'm not trying to ignore your question. It's just, it's, it's slightly off topic for today. And I don't want to get into how it is separate people can list Presently, I think it's more of a meritable dispute issue, and I dealt with it in the family law lectures that we've, we've done in the past. So with your permission, I'm going to pass on that, okay? No and I'll, I'll talk to you about it after this. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's go to the parts that we care about, the commission. So what this says, and this is really the heart of uh, the listing agreement and the buyer representation agreement. Really, very little else matters. Most of what the buyer representation agreement and listing agreement deals with afterwards is that the forms of representation have been explained to the parties that um, you know you have permission to market um, that there's going to be insurance of the property that everything you're saying is true. All of these things are very much understood as a matter of course, and those aren't very difficult. What is difficult is the section two and the section two causes great concern. What it says is that in consideration of the listing brokerage. Uh, you guys are still, sorry, you guys are still seeing my form, <coughs> my listing agreement form, right? That's what I'm sharing with you right now. Can someone just confirm? Uh, I'm, you guys are yes. still seeing, yes, okay. So in consideration of the listing brokerage listing the property, the seller agrees to pay the listing brokerage a commission of X percent of the sale of the property for any valid offer to purchase the property from any source whatsoever obtained during the listing period. So let's go into this. In consideration of the listing brokerage listing the property, the seller agrees to pay the listing brokerage a commission of X for the sale price of the property uh, uh, or for any valid offer to purchase the property from any source whatsoever obtained during the listing period and on the terms and conditions set out in this agreement. So the question then arises, what happens, and this happens all the time, what happens if I am brought an offer at my list price set out in this agreement without conditions and I choose and my, my listing party rejects it. Does he owe me commission? The answer is under the strict reading of this agreement of purchase and sale. Yes. If you have offered for sale something that has, let's say I offer my property for a million dollars and a million dollars, is proffered to you and it is a agreement of purchase and sale that has no conditions, then technically the listing agent is entitled to claim commission. I am going to stop and I'm going to qualify what I'm saying and I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to instead share with you a different case. And the case I'm going to share with you is Wellity Realty and Fadi. And what happens here is that there is a listing agreement with the brokerage. And the listing price was not a strategy to induce higher offers. It was fair market value. In fact, not only was it fair market value, uh, it had been lowered. This listing agreement had gone through six months. There was fights about whether or not they would accept this agreement if an offer is brought in unconditionally on these terms at this price. And they had to scream and fight with their clients and it was induced as evidence throughout. Um, and eventually the seller said, yes, if you can bring me an offer at this amount, which by the way, everyone still believed was very high. He said, I'll accept it. And so he signed the listing agreement on that basis. At that point, um, an agreement, a full unconditional offer was brought and then they rejected it. And the so by the brokerage sued for commission. And um, they said that the fact that it wasn't accepted did not in any way negate the fact that commissions were due and owing in this case. Um, it's really critical that you understand this in context. 
Uh, I live in CO2. Uh, CO2, as with so many other areas now, um, you know, the main listing agent here has a strategy of listing every single house at $999,000. It doesn't matter as long as it's under 2 million bucks, 999 is the price every single time. And like clockwork, they get 999 every single time. If the only offer that would come in on a $1.6 million house is 999, then the offer could in fact be uh, rejected. Um, and I don't think a court would enforce uh, this provision. Why? Well, it's particularly because of the way that, well, first of all, because the strategy was never really to accept uh, 999. Uh, that was never really what the parties were agreeing to. They were agreeing to a strategic end and that would be induced in court. And I think the court would give good credence to that. But also, if I may just point out, I'm gonna share with you again, the listing agreement. Uh, the way this right, the way this is written is it says, to offer the property for sale at a price of this upon the terms particularly set out herein or at, and at such other price and or terms acceptable to the seller. I would think that the words terms acceptable to the seller would uh, then allow evidence to be induced that said the terms that we had entered into this agreement on was that you will be able to list at that amount. And we filed this listing agreement on that basis, but you knew we were never going to accept it. Therefore, there was no reasonable reason to expect a commission would be payable. And I think a court would be agreeable to that. Weller, Realty, and Foddy, the case I just showed you, shows that under a strict reading of the agreement, yes, it's due and owing, but context matters. And I don't think anyone should be reliant upon the terms of the listing agreement to claim commission if they are listing artificially low as a strategy that will be induced to the court. And I think a court will see through that lose in two minutes. Uh, does, that make, does that make sense? It, it's a bit of a complex answer, but it's, I think, the right answer uh, as it pertains to that age-old question, can I claim commission if I get an offer unconditional uh, pursuant to the terms of the listing agreement? Okay, so we're going to go back. Um, you are still seeing Form 200, um, and let's move on. I know you guys understand this. Um, but effectively, uh, seller authorizes the listing brokerage to cooperate. So this is how much we're going to pay to the other side. Great, no problem. I'm going to point out the holdover period. The seller further agrees to pay such commission as calculated above if the agreement of purchase and sale is agreed to or accepted to by the seller or anyone on the seller's behalf within X days after expiration, exp expiration of the listing period, so long as such agreement is with anyone who's introduced to the property from any source whatsoever during the listing period. There is case law where during the holding period, an offer was brought, but the um, seller was able to show that the party was not introduced to the property during the listing period. Uh, this case law is actually something that the OREA text makes reference to. Um, and what happened was uh, it was an offer to purchase out one of the units in a commercial shopping center where the uh, existing, um, where, where the person who made the offer was already in that shopping center and had been for five years previous. So it was clear they weren't introduced to the premise uh, during the uh, listing period and thus uh, the holdover period was invalid. And I just pointed that out to you. Um, I'd like to leave out the remainder of section 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 through to 16, because I want to address really um, how section 2 of the listing agreement and section 2 of the BRA uh, are to be understood from the perspective of your legal rights to commission should a deal fail. This is coming directly from a previous talk that I gave called Protecting Your Commissions. And I frankly stole these last several slides directly from that. If you have an interest in finding out more or a detailed analysis of what's going on, please check out Protecting Your Commissions, uh, which again is on our website, my website at MJM Legal, or on our forum. Uh, but the question really is, okay, in the event that a deal does not go forward, can you explain to me how section two of the BRA and section two of the listing agreement work such that I may be able to claim commission? So 
realistically, you're either acting for a seller, uh, sorry, you're either acting for a buyer or you're acting for a seller. And what either happens is a seller is defaulting or a buyer is defaulting. So if you have signed listing agreements and a signed agreement of purchase and sale, and you are looking to rely on getting your commission back using section two of either the BRA or the listing agreement, how does it work? And that's kind of what I wanted to spend the next five minutes on. So we're aware that section two of, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sharing the right screen with you. I'm sorry, hold on a second. Someone really needs to point out when I'm sitting here doing, uh, when, I'm, when I'm going through this type of stuff. So what I was saying to you before is, you can either have a seller default or you can have a buyer default and you're either acting for the cooperating brokerage or you're acting for the selling brokerage. Those are the only options that happens when a deal goes south, assuming that a BRA and a listing agreement was properly signed. How do you get your commission based on the use and the understanding of these clauses? Well, we have section two of the BRA and we have section two of the listing agreement. And in both instances, the buyer has agreed to pay the commission if it is their fault that the deal falls through. And the seller agrees to pay the commission if it is their fault that it falls through. And so under the terms of section two of the BRA and listing agreement, it seems very clear. We can fill in our chart and we can say that when you are acting for the cooperating brokerage and the buyer defaults, you're allowed to sue them under the section two agreement and say that I'm owed commission. And if the seller defaults and you're acting for the selling brokerage, you are allowed to sue them because the seller has to pay. And as a result, section two is really good at protecting our rights in this box and this box. It talks nothing about this box and this box. What happens if the seller defaults and I'm acting for the co-op? And what happens if the buyer defaults and I'm acting for the selling brokerage? And to that end, we have to augment our knowledge with the following, MLS rule 760. Again, I talked about this in a previous lecture, but I'm just gonna talk about it now. What it says is that in the event that a commission is not paid to the listing brokerage, and you are acting for the cooperating brokerage, the cooperating brokerage can, for if it's done through MLS, then the cooperating brokerage can force the listing brokerage to sue its own client. Why? Because oftentimes if the seller defaults, the seller brokerage says, well, you know what? They're still going with me. I'm just gonna list it again. I don't wanna sue my client. That's gonna put me in a bad position. The co-op, they're just gonna have to deal. Co-op agent doesn't have to deal. The co-op agent can force the listing agreement to sign their own, sue their own client if in fact this is a deal done under MLS rules. And I'm not going to go into great detail about it, but suffice it to say that section two of the BRA and section two of the listing agreement are augmented by MLS rule 760 such that we can now fill in this section where if the seller defaults and you're acting for the cooperating brokerage and if it's on MLS, the seller can force, uh, sorry, the cooperating brokerage can force the seller to sue uh, their, the selling brokerage to sue their seller client on their behalf. And in that way, claim commission. Of course, still doesn't answer what happens if the seller defaults and you are acting for a cooperating brokerage or what happens if the buyer defaults and you're acting for the selling brokerage. Again, this was all, I'm going through this very quickly, but this was all part of my protecting your commissions talk. Feel free to look it up if you need greater detail than this. And this is where I think there's some very interesting law to be had that I haven't been able to find yet on Canley, and that is the negligence claims. Uh, I think it's only a matter of time really until um, someone who is in this bubble or this bubble chooses to sue the other party in basic negligence. Because while there is no contract that exists as between the selling brokerage, sorry, as between the cooperating brokerage if the seller defaults and it's not MLS, and as there is no contract that exists as between a buyer that defaults and if you're acting for the seller brokerage, there definitely is tortious claims in negligence. Uh, negligence, an action is considered to be negligent. You don't need a contract for this. You can, if you can show that there's a duty of care that's owed, and I do think that there's a duty of care with people with whom uh, we are engaging in contract. And if the person has fallen below an appropriate standard of care, the appropriate standard of care in this instance is abiding by your contractual terms. And that, if that activity results in harm to a third party, which in fact this does, suddenly these people don't get their commissions, right? This person doesn't get their commission, this person doesn't get their commission. Then you can establish a negligence claim in tort. Um, you know, commissions are now worth a lot of money. 
many commissions are $100,000, $75,000, whatever it is. It's really only going to be a matter of time until someone goes to a lawyer and says, you know what? I may not have the right to sue because I acted for the cooperative brokerage and the seller defaulted an exclusive deal, not under MLS. And I may not have the right to sue because I'm acting uh, for the selling brokerage and the buyer defaulted. But their actions were negligent, fell below the standard of care that we expect from every contracting party and directly caused me harm. Please sue them in negligence under the contract concept of tort. Um, and while our forms don't deal with this, I do think that uh, this is really an action ready to happen and we'll fill out our chart nicely when it happens, I'll bring it to everyone's attention. So I know I kind of went really quickly through the listing agreement and the BRA, um, but I, I am bringing it up largely because um, uh, I had extra time today and I thought it would be interesting and I do intend to do additional forms that the OREA brings up, but I did bring, I did hope that I touched on those elements that are most important about the BRA uh, and about the listing agreement and specifically section two, making sure that you have the appropriate people signing these agreements and what happens if you get your agreement um, that is stipulated and called for in the agreement on the terms that is called for by the agreement. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions. Uh, we are actually at the end of the hour. This has been exactly an hour, so it wasn't 45 minutes. But again, I would encourage everyone to look up part one of this video such that they have a robust and under, a complete understanding of how Form 101 works in conjunction with Form 100, the BRA, and the listing agreement. And if anyone has any, as, as you watch these videos, if you have any particular form that you want to explain next, please let me know as I will continue these form discussions uh, going forward. Anyone have any other questions? No? Okay, well, look, I wanna thank everyone who attended. Uh, again, uh, this will be posted on the website shortly. Um, and uh, thank you for continuing to make our forum an amazing one. Uh, I look forward to many more of these fun uh, Wednesday or Tuesday morning sessions. And um, yeah, I wish you all a great day. Keep on rocking in the amazing real estate market that we are currently experiencing.